This is Breeze TV. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Breeze TV. I'm Kent Irwin. And I'm Caitlin Merriman. Thanks for joining us. The JMU Board of Visitors held a public hearing on Tuesday, April 9th, to discuss a possible change in tuition and fees for the next school year. Reporter Grace James gives us further details on the topic. We've all seen the construction going on around campus. We're getting some new facilities, but to keep up with the resources needed to maintain them, JMU students and families might see a tuition increase for the 2019 to 2020 school year. Besides the increased costs for new facilities, the April 9th meeting discussed other factors for a rise in tuition, including the university's 16 to one student to faculty ratio and compensation increases for faculty and staff per the new state budget. There was a presentation of the to it, like the proposed tuition increase for in-state and out-of-state. Um, they kind of gave a rundown about reasons why they um, are pursuing like an increase or not an increase and like how we rank amongst other school, Virginia schools. For undergraduate students, this could mean a 0 to 4% increase for those in-state and a 2.1 to 4% increase for those out-of-state as well as a 3 to 4 percent increase in fees for all students. The percentages may seem small, but not everyone is in favor of the idea of a higher tuition. Like, I don't know anyone who, who's going to live in the new dorm, um, so I don't feel like, like my class should have to pay more for something we don't use. I think that they should have a set standard for what tuition is as people come in and then it stays the same every year so that students can plan better about how they're spending their money with tuition. Although JMU's tuition may increase, JMU still has one of the lowest tuition costs out of all Virginia public universities. A tuition increase in the end, long run, is gonna benefit us and we're gonna see those actual benefits to the whole student body within the next couple of years. The JMU Board of Visitors plans to meet on Friday, April 26, to discuss a possible increase in tuition. Reporting for Breeze TV, I'm Grace James. We've all. The city of Harrisonburg has proposed a public safety ordinance that would prohibit individuals from lingering in medians. Our reporter Olivia Hauk has more details about how that would affect the community. Thanks, Ken. This new ordinance would prohibit pedestrians from standing, sitting, squatting, or lying on medians in different intersections in town. Some community members are attempting to stop the ordinance from passing. After the Harrisonburg Police Department gathered accident data from seven congested intersections in town, the city realized that there needs to be restrictions on pedestrians occupying medians. What we're trying to do is reduce the chances of, a, of an unpleasant interaction between a pedestrian and an automobile. Um, again, these are very busy intersections where we don't want someone just standing in the median strip or, or doing other activities there interacting with cars or taking the driver's attention away from the intersection. In recent years, similar pedestrian ordinances in surrounding counties have been ruled too broad and have since been overturned by the courts. What the court said is if you want to prohibit this type of behavior, you're, you're dealing with arguably a constitutionally protected right, so you have to have a compelling governmental interest, you have to have a very narrow focused, you have to do the minimum amount that you can to, to to correct that public safety uh, hazard. On Tuesday evening, opponents of the proposed ordinance rallied in Court Square to spread awareness of what they believe is an anti-panhandling measure in order to criminalize homelessness. This is not the way to deal with traffic problems. It's also a whole orientation that, that, that responds to homelessness, which panhandling is connected to, people in desperate need, um, it responds to it in a way that criminalizes it. Okay. And that is not the way to deal with homelessness, either from a humane point of view, because these are human beings and they deserve to be treated humanely. They also have rights. But the other thing that it does is it doesn't work. However, the city states that the ordinance is not a target against the local homeless population. We would stress it's not an anti-panhandling ordinance. A person, if, if you happen to be a panhandler, if instead of being on the medium, you move over to the sidewalk on the side of those intersections, that's okay. Reporting for Breeze TV in Harrisonburg, I'm Olivia Hauk. The Harrisonburg City Council is hosting a public hearing on April 23rd at 7 o'clock in council chambers. We'll keep you updated on any decisions. Back to you, Caitlin and Kent. 
Thanks, Olivia. Next up on Breeze TV, an old bit building is getting a new design on campus. And an exclusive interview with Andy Parker about his new book and advocacy. All this and more, and more on Breeze TV. This is Breeze TV. The James Madison Administrative Complex, known as JMAC No. 6 on Harrison Street, is undergoing a major renovation. The previous building was constructed in 1960 as doctor's offices to serve the old hospital. The JMU Foundation is funding the $8.2 million project and the new administrative building is set to open in November 2020. The building has kind of outlasted its, its useful life. Um, so this was an opportunity to partner with the JMU Foundation to put up new, more, um, and better suited office space to the university's needs. The Heritage Museum in Dayton, home of the Harrisonburg Rockingham Historical Society, is now offering free genealogy research services to the public. As of March 30th, the museum began using a digital database called Family Search to help museum visitors learn more about their ancestors. The site is free to use on personal computers, but the museum provides a additional access to records the users can't get at home. In addition to genealogy research, the Heritage Museum offers large gallery spaces, housing local and Civil War artifacts, and a local history library. More information can be found on valleyheritagemuseums.org. On August 26, 2015, news reporter and JMU alum Allison Parker and photojournalist Adam Ward were shot and killed during a live broadcast in Roanoke, Virginia. Our reporter David Ramirez spoke with Allison's father about his new book. Since the death of his daughter, Allison's father, Andy Parker, has dedicated his life to honoring his daughter's memory through action and change. Earlier this week, I had the opportunity to speak with the author and activist on everything from his fight against the gun lobby, his daughter's legacy, and turning unimaginable grief into a renewed sense of purpose. Here's just a glimpse of our conversation. Well, first off, thank you so much for agreeing uh, to speak with me today. I really appreciate it, and I'm glad we can make this work out. Oh, my pleasure. Um, I read the book. I spent my spring, spring break reading it. Um, I have it right here. Um, as you can see, I have a bunch of notes in it. It's empowering. It's beautiful, but it's painful. And the whole time I was reading it, I couldn't imagine how hard it was to go back in and unpack that pain of what you and your family went through. Why did you decide to do that? And why did you decide to write the book? I felt like I needed to tell Allison's story and I wanted people to know more about her. Uh, the book is part memoir and it's part current affairs and uh, it's a call to action. So I felt like I owed it to her and frankly, it was as much her gift to me as it was mine to her. It really did. It, I mean, it felt that way. And uh, the title of it is For Allison, the murder of a young journalist and a father's fight for gun safety. And you can feel the love for your daughter. It's, it's tangible on every page. And I just wanted to ask you, and you say in the book, it's impossible. You could fill a million books trying to describe uh, what Allison was like and what she meant to you. But if you could um, give us just a glimpse of who Allison was. David, she was exceptional. Um, everything, I was always amazed that everything she touched, she did, she did very well. Uh, she was driven, she was competitive, but you know, beyond that, she was, um, she was just a kind soul. And she touched and inspired so many people. And one of the things that I have, or several of the things that I have um, learned along this journey are, are stories from people that she touched you know they would tell me allison stories that i never knew about and it just it melted my heart so i uh, uh you know she was she was beautiful on the outside and just as beautiful if not more on the inside and you um write a lot about the struggle to make some kind of meaning out of tragedy and uh from the day allison was killed, you vowed not only to keep her memory alive, um, but to channel your anger and heartbreak into um, something productive and action towards change. So what do you think Allison would say about all the advocacy and work that you've done in her name and in her honor? I'd like to think she'd be proud of her, her dad. And um, I, that's one reason that I 
decided early on, in fact, that day, uh, when you have something happen to you like this, uh, whenever you lose someone unexpectedly and you're devastated beyond what you can imagine, you got to find a purpose. You've got to find a purpose to, to move on and to do something, uh, as they said in uh, you know, I, I read uh, a review of, of the book, and and one of the, you know, this this woman that, that read it said uh, pulled a, a quote from the Shawshank Redemption, and Red says, "Get busy living or get busy dying." And so, rather than curl up in a fetal position, I chose to honor Allison through action, and that's what I've tried to do. Now, if there's one thing that you want people to take away. Um, from reading this book, what would that be? I want people to know her. I want people to know more about her and just get a sense of who she was and how special she was. If, if you don't get anything else out of the book, I want you to know about Allison. Well, I want to thank you so much again for taking the time uh, to speak with me. And, and just on a personal note, I just want you to know uh, that her presence, her memory is felt um, every day here in this studio and every show that we do here and every project we work on across the hall. Um, her legacy here is alive and well and, and it's due in part to the work you're doing and to the incredible person she was and I have no doubt that it'll, it'll live on. Thank you, David. She does live on. She's, uh, she's right there in the studio with you and right here, you know, with me. Thank you so much again. I appreciate it. And for anybody who hasn't gotten the chance to read For Allison, A Father's Fight for Gun Safety, please pick up a copy. It's available everywhere. Give it a read. Thank you. If you'd like to watch our full interview with Andy Parker, head to the Breeze TV Facebook and YouTube pages to watch the full 15-minute interview. Kent, back to you. It was so nice to hear from Andy about his book and how he's doing. Yeah, and just like David said, I mean, I think all of us can attest that we feel her every Friday in the studio, guiding over us and watching over us in some way. So. Mm -hmm. But you know, coming up after our commercial break, sports will, uh, sports will be going on. Paige is gonna have some updates for us. So what's going on? That's right. Well, our neighbors across the mountain brought Charlottesville their first NCAA men's basketball title, and honors were won for some Dukes. Coming up on the Breeze TV Sports Wrap. This is Breeze TV. It was a good week for JMU and the state of Virginia as a whole. Welcome back. I'm Paige Ellenberger. After a once-in-a-lifetime win, UVA fans and students took to the streets, climbed telephone poles, and yes, lit couches on fire in celebration. The Hoos arguably made one of the biggest comebacks in NCAA men's basketball history. After losing to the 16th seed UMBC as number one in the first round of last year's March Madness, the Cavaliers bounced back to win it all, but barely. It was a narrative the Hoos were familiar with this whole postseason, making buckets in the final seconds to force overtime. In fact, the last three of their games have come down to last second points. Virginia watched a 10 point lead halfway through the second half drop off to a three point deficit. Here's how it played out. With 14 seconds left in regulation, redshirt sophomore DeAndre Hunter came in clutch. He hit a three from the right corner, forcing the game to go into overtime. OT was a fight by both teams, but with 30 seconds left, the Hoos led by five and only added to it to wrap it all up. Virginia wins the title, 85-77. to After winning back-to-back -back CAA championship titles, their ninth in program history, the Swimming and Diving Dukes won all CAA awards, starting with head coach Dane Peterson, who was selected as Swimming Coach of the Year, and John Walsh, who was picked as the Diving Coach of the Year. Junior Bonnie Zhang was voted as Swimmer of the Year. She won weekly honors four times this season. Freshman Morgan Whaley was tabbed Rookie Swimmer of the Year. And finally, sophomore Faith Anderson was awarded with Diver of the Year. Anderson was the only CAA diver to compete at the NCAA Zone A Championships back in the beginning of March. Some other Dukes racked up multiple weekly honors as well. Starting off with softball's right fielder, sophomore Logan Newton, who led JMU during last week's Hofstra series. She homered twice, tallied eight RBIs, and batted a 583. Molly Dougherty, a redshirt sophomore goalkeeper for the lacrosse team, earned herself CAA Defensive Player of the Week, following her performances at Delaware and against Towson. 
for doubles team Paul Mendoza and Tate Steiner. They received doubles team of the week for the second time this season. Steiner also earned player of the week after securing two matches against Radford this week. And it's been a while since we talked football, but former defensive lineman and two-time All-American Andrew Ankara signed his golden ticket to the NFL. Ankara signed a three-year free agent contract with the Washington Redskins on Monday. Ankara was with the Dukes from 2013 to 2017 and finished up as one of the FCS top defenders. Won the FCS Athletics Director Association Defensive Player of the Year Award and was the second runner-up for the Stats FCS Buck Butchingham Award. He finished his time at JMU with 117 total tackles, 36 tackles for loss, 26 sacks, 8 forced fumbles, and 3 fumble recoveries. Post-JMU, Ankara played for the Orlando Apollos in the AAF. I reached out via Instagram and Ankara said JMU has helped him transition into now being in the NFL and he will be forever grateful for JMU. Ankara will join six other alumni in pro stadiums this season. And speaking of football, JMU fans will be getting a sample of what the Dukes are cooking up for this season. Its annual spring game kicks off at 1 p.m. tomorrow at Bridgeforth Stadium. Gates will open at noon. There will be no parking regulations and tailgates will start at 9 a.m. The game will be played in two regulation, 15-minute quarters. It's going to be purple versus white with offensive wearing purple and quarterbacks wearing red. And coming up tonight, all of the Dukes are away. It's the first day of the CAA Championships for Women's Golf. Track and Field is down at Miami U at the Hurricane Alumni Inventational, enjoying warm weather, I'm sure. Baseball is at in-state foe William & Mary. First pitch will be thrown at 6 p.m. And the Lacrosse Dukes are in Philly, facing off against the Drexel Dragons. You can watch that game on NBC Sports Washington+. Plus. Join us next week for all of the updates. Back to you guys. Next on Breeze TV, an inside look on JMU's club Quidditch team preparing for the national championship this weekend. And our senior reporter Anna Saunders is live at a local dairy farm. I can't wait to see what she's up to out there. All this and more on Breeze TV. This is Breeze TV. T-Pain is coming to JMU this Tuesday and will be performing at the Convocation Spe Center with his special guest, Two Friends. Doors open at 6.45 p.m. and the show starts at 8 p.m. You can still get tickets online to enjoy T-Pain's classic hits like Best Love Song and Buy You a Drink. And more in entertainment um, happening this weekend. This Saturday is Maddie Palooza, the festival at Festival. It will be hosted on JMU's East Campus. Maddie Palooza is a music festival that includes free food, free drinks, and exciting games that will be going on throughout the entire event. The event is free and it starts at 1 p.m. And guess what? All students, they're welcome. No, there aren't wands and spells, but there is a national championship in sight for JMU's club Quidditch team. Reporter T.J. Guterman and producer Craig Allison have the latest. 31 college club Quidditch teams, and 60 of them get to compete for the national championship this weekend in Texas. I'm here at one of their practices, and here's how they're preparing for the national title. For Claire Kinsey, it's about giving all energy for club Quidditch. I just try to give like as much time um, as I can and like my full commitment to this team. Combining elements of basketball and dodgeball, oh, oh, shot, go. Quidditch serves as a hybrid of sports inspired by the Harry Potter series. And it's about finding the open spaces for the best chance to score. Leaders like Brandon Wright have stepped up by giving constructive play feedback and having others adjust to his play style. We've done everything that we can up until this point to kind of prepare ourselves and the team to succeed as best that we see can. And for others, it's their chance to compete past high school. Sports have always been something that's very important to me. And for me to have a sport that I can play in addition to my academics is something that's really important to me. Coming to the national championship for JMU's second time won't be easy, but Claire says she's feeling optimistic. I think we have one of the best teams we've had in years. And with the tournament happening this weekend, everything is at stake. Reporting for Breeze TV, I'm TJ Guterman. A local dairy farm just won Producer of the Year for Virginia and Maryland. Our senior reporter Anna Saunders is live at the farm now. Anna, I expect you to be milking some cows, but you know what? What's going on out there? 
You know, Caitlin, I was expecting the same thing, but I'm here at Winding Rivers Farm in Weir's Cave, Virginia, and I'm learning all kinds of stuff about the dairy industry. And I'm here with the farmer his, himself, Mr. West Kent West. Thanks so much for letting us come out here today, and congratulations on your big win. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so we're here in front of this milking machine, and can you kind of explain to us how this process works, what we're kind of looking at here? Uh, yes, this is the Laylee Astronaut Robotic Milker. Um, as you can see, it's milking one of our Holstein cows. Uh, fully automated, the milking process is completely done by this machine, which we call a robot. Wow. So you all just won producer of the year. There are cows kind of all over the place. I mean, if we take a look over here, just, I mean, cows all over the place. So do you, would you say kind of winning that award is more about the quantity of the product you all produce or the quality? The award is based mostly on quality. Um, quality merits such as bacteria counts, somatic cell counts, and, and other aspects to coliform counts as well. So today is National Grilled Cheese Day. What a perfect time to be at a dairy farm. I know it's a big time, you know, college favorite food. I eat a lot, but you know, we often don't think about where our food comes from. So can you kind of talk about the importance of knowing where these dairy products come from? Uh, yes, it's very important to, to realize the hard work and dedication that dairy farmers do put into producing the highest quality product that they can produce. Um, you know, the higher quality of the milk, the better the ch quality of the cheese and the better tasting the cheese. Um, we also give a lot of care to our animals. We probably take better care of the animals than we do ourselves a lot of times. And um, that's pretty much it. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for letting us come out here. I'm going to hang out with my friends for a little bit longer, but I'm going to send it back to you all in the studio. All right, Anna, you should grab some cheese so we can make some grilled cheese after the show. That would be very good for, of course, the holiday today. Mm -hmm. Anna is always out there having so much fun on her I stories. Know. We should have gone with her. I want to see the, the show, cows. Have the show in the barn with all the muck. Yeah. I mean, I mean, did you see the cool cows of all the pictures we saw earlier you know she was sending it like looking at them in the field also well, playing with our equipment yeah too. the cows were out there grabbing on the producer's shirt pulling it but yeah fun times with the cows yeah. out in the barn thank you so much for joining us have a great friday